Your support shows us that we're in the right place at the right time for the best of all concern. So you can depend on us every two weeks to show up with something that will make your life a little bit more reasonable and loving. So welcome to another episode of Everything ALS. Lisa, it's all yours. Thank you, McFinn, and thank you everybody for joining us today um, for our Everything ALS bi-monthly webinars where we love to bring the experts right to your living room. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Lisa Deegan and I'm part of the Everything ALS team because I lost my younger brother, John, to ALS a few years back. So our aim really is to provide um, information and resources that we didn't have when we were going through this journey. Um, so today we're going to be talking about a super important topic, assistive technology for communication with ALS and the spectrum of options that are existing for you today. Thank you for participating in our survey. We had tons of responses and this really helped us to tailor our presentation to fit your needs. So thank you for those who participated. I will be putting in our chat how to stay informed with everything ALS and how to get involved. So everybody pay attention to the chat. So for that, I am now excited to introduce our speakers for the evening. So we have Lisa Bardak from ALS of Michigan and Emily Kornman from Team Gleason. And they both have their Certificate of Clinical Competence in Speech Language Pathology. Emily Kornman brings an experience from working in ALS multidisciplinary clinics and neuro rehab outpatient clinics. She brings a critical depth of knowledge to help assist people living with ALS. And she values working with each patient and listening and assisting them with their needs. Lisa Bardak from ALS of Michigan is nationally recognized for her expertise in augmentative alternative communication, known as AAC, specifically in helping people with severe physical challenges gain access to communication technology. Lisa developed and implemented the AAC Center, a regional clinic to provide AAC and assistive technology services to PALS throughout Michigan. She's dedicated to ensuring that PALS have a way to communicate throughout the course of the disease, helping them to implement low-tech and high-tech methods of communication. She provides evaluation and training for PALS in need of communication, speech generating devices, and computer access, as well as telephone technology. Thank you so much, Lisa and Emily, for joining us tonight. The floor is yours. So we are going to have some time at the end for questions. So if y'all have any questions, just go ahead and drop them in the chat, and then we're going to get to them at the end. I'm really excited to be with all of you today, virtually, and I hope that this presentation is beneficial in some way for you. Today, again, we're going to be talking about a spectrum of options and assistive technology for communication. All right, so who are each of you? You all might share similar experiences and similar emotions on this journey, um, but your journeys will be very different. And we want to know, we want to make sure that you know you should be treated and assessed in that way. Um, your communication needs are all unique, and we want your speech pathologist and your therapist to work with you based on your unique needs, because there is no one best path or best solution for everyone. And who are we? So Lisa Bardak and I are both speech language pathologists, and these are some of the roles that we may play in your care. So we would complete AAC assessment without delay. That means from the very beginning when we're meeting with you, we're going to start learning about who are your communication partners, what are your methods of communications, and again, what is unique about your communication. And then we can go ahead and monitor changes as they happen, and then implement things um, as you start noticing difficulties. We're going to assess, assess all methods of communication. So face-to-face -face communication, but also um, how to use your phone, how do you get in touch with people through email and social media. We know that those forms are super important as well as face-to-face -face communication. We're going to provide ongoing support and training for AAC. So again, we're not just gonna give you this technology, but we really wanna make sure that you're comfortable in using it. And if things change, we're there for you to adapt and adjust what you're using. We're also going to collaborate with other members of your team as necessary. 
All right, so I'm an employee of the Gleason Foundation and I have no other financial relationships to disclose. Lisa Bardak is an employee of ALS of Michigan and owner of Communicating Solutions, LLC. Some objectives for today. I want you to be able to describe some communication strategies to use at different stages of dysarthria. Learn different access options to allow for continued use of face-to-face -face and distance communication. Learn about different low-tech tools. Learn about end-of-life communication. And then understand your role in advocating for an evidence-based evaluation with the clinician. We're going to go deeper into all of those. So before we start, um, I just wanted to go over some things I'll be saying often in face-to-face um, -face communication. That refers to anyone you're speaking with in your immediate environment or vicinity. Distance communication is using those tools like email, uh, FaceTime, texting to communicate with others, but it could also be communicating or getting uh, the attention of your caregiver in another room. So access method is something that we'll be speaking about often as well. And access method is how will you access those uh, forms of communication? I mean, how will you access that technology? So are you going to use your hands and touch it? Are you going to use voice control, et cetera? We can't go through all of these today, but we are gonna dive a little bit deeper into some of them. All right, so again, we're gonna start off with this dysarthria stages and how is your communication gonna change and what can we do as it changes? Dysarthria rating scale, um, we're going to talk more about each one of these stages, but really quick, I just wanna acknowledge that a lot of individuals say, you know, I wasn't diagnosed until my speech already changed and now I feel like I'm playing catch up. So just so you know, you're not alone. A lot of people do feel that way and that does happen often but we're here for you no matter what stage you're at, and we're gonna find ways to help you wherever you are on this rating scale, okay? Wherever you are with your speech. So stage one is no detectable speech disorder. A lot of people also say, well, if I'm not having any changes in speech, should I see a speech pathologist? And yes, here are some things that we can help you with from the very beginning. We're gonna work with education and counseling. So we want to be able to educate you on how things might progress and how things might change. And then let's get you prepared for those changes ahead of time so you don't feel like you're playing catch up. Um, we're gonna counsel you and we can uh, guide you to some community resources like local ALS support groups or AT assistive technology loan closets if that becomes necessary. Um, we're going to take those baseline measurements just so that we can continue to monitor have any changes occurred and uh, change from your baseline. If so, let's implement something to help out. And then voice preservation, one of my favorite topics, which we're going to talk about now. Um, voice preservation refers to how are you going to save your voice and what makes your voice unique to put on a communication device if you ever have to use one of those in the future. Um, we don't know what's going to happen, but we do hear from a lot of pals that as things have changed with their voice uh, and they're happy they put in the work ahead of time so that they did have that voice on their communication device. Our voice tells so much about our personality. You'll probably hear me say y'all quite a few times throughout this because I'm from New Orleans and that's one of the things I say. But um, I would want that. I would want the unique things that tell about my age, culture, gender. I want all of that to be saved on a device. Um, so voice banking refers to the process of turning your speech into a synthetic voice. So, you know, it depends on which platform you use. You might record 50 phrases. You might record more than that. But using those phrases to create a synthetic voice that can read out anything you say and a voice that's similar to yours. So I say similar because it doesn't have all the emotion and tone in it, but it can read out, we can't predict what we're gonna say in the future. So it can read out anything we have to say in a voice like ours. And I will show y'all how mine sounds. I think we need to schedule a doctor's appointment. So it sounds pretty good. That was used, uh, I just 50 phrases on acapella. And it sounds like me, but it doesn't have the ups and downs that you're hearing right now in my voice. So to make up for that, we do what's called message banking. And we also record legacy messages. And these are ways that we can really get our emotion and tone in what we're saying. Um, it's complementary to voice banking. And 
it's good if you have a dog, which you're gonna hear mine, uh, they might not respond to your synthesized voice, but they will respond to your banked message. Cheaty, come here. So of course, that's just one of the many things that you can bank. Uh, that one would obviously be important to me. All right, and these messages are really your trademarks or isms. So what makes you unique? You might not under, like people who aren't familiar with you might not understand what you're saying whenever you say, mm hmm a certain way, but all of your friends and family will absolutely know what that means. So these are also good messages to record. Finally, double dipping is the process of using those banked messages to create the synthetic voice. So again, banked messages are the ones that basically sound like a recording. If you were to record it on your phone, play it back, you hear exactly all the ups and downs. And then voice banking is a synthesized voice. So you're using the banked messages to create that banked voice and you kind of get two for one, but it does uh, require about 800 messages. So it is a heavy lifting to do that many messages. All right, so stage two, obvious speech disorder with intelligible speech. And we say obvious, but it's not always that obvious to you because you might not realize what's going on, but you notice at the end of the day, it's really hard for me to talk. I'm more tired and I don't like talking when I'm tired or it's hard to speak in a large crowd. That's because we are having some of those changes to our speech. Um, so because of that, we want you to continue speaking and speaking easily. So we're gonna implement some of these speech strategies and work with your communication partner to really increase that communicative effectiveness. So how effective is your message? And we don't want you to have to repeat it because again, that's gonna make you more tired. So let's really increase how effective the first message is so you don't have to say it over and over again. So some things that we can do, and I can't go over all of these unfortunately because of timing, but um, over articulation is one. So making sure we're not glossing over any of those sounds in a word, and we're really sounding out using our tongue and our lips to hit all of the sounds like water or sounds that we typically would gloss over. Topic cueing is gonna be really great for you and your communication partner. For example, if you wanna talk about fishing, you would just let them know ahead of time, and then they know what words to start listening for. They might not always understand what you're saying, but they'll know, okay, if we're talking about fishing, he probably means that. Um, and then going to the communication partner, putting a lot of the heavy lifting on them, because they, you know, for example, if they don't understand everything you say, they can go ahead and repeat parts of the phrase that they do understand, and then you can fill in the one or two words that they missed out on. So you're not doing all of the work of repeating yourself, but they're doing that and you're just helping them out. Um, looking at your communication partner as they speak, that's super important because we wanna use all the cues we can to kind of understand what they're saying. So we wanna read their lips, we wanna be close to them, not speak to them at a distance. And uh, we wanna reduce that background noise. You don't want them to compete with the TV or the music. That's just pretty tough already to speak over all of that. And finally, voice amplification. We hear so often from pals that this really makes a difference for them because before they were really tired and at the end of the day, they might not have wanted to talk. What the voice amplifier does, it allows you to speak softer, use less of those muscles and less of that effort and it does all the work for you. So you can speak longer throughout the day without using up all of that energy in the beginning of the day. I can um, talk softer. And when I talk softer, almost a whisper, that allows me to kind of listen to what I'm saying. It allows me to pay attention to the pacing of what I'm saying and the technique that I'm using while I'm talking, and it saves energy all at the same time, which is awesome. So I find this to be very helpful, very useful. Here it comes. And that was not coached. <laughs> all right, so stage three and stage four. 
stage three is when we're going to start looking into that AAC evaluation. So there is going to be that change in how your speech sounds, uh, environmental, situational changes as well. So maybe it's super hard to communicate in some of these environments or, um, you know, if I'm out at a restaurant, I really am not very effective with my communication. Stage four is when you're using that AAC system as a part of your daily routine because you notice that natural speech isn't enough at points of the day. So we get a question often about how do I know it's time for an AAC evaluation? Um, it's challenging because we don't ever want to wait too long and then you're putting out fires and you're not as, you know, again, you have that feeling of, oh, I'm trying to play catch up but you also don't want to go way too soon that you're um, missing out on something that could happen in the future and missing out on a good opportunity by going too soon for the eval. So what research shows is that around 125 words per minute signifies that we should start looking into an AAC evaluation. Um, one thing to also consider at this time is that the normal speech rate is around 185 to 220. And then you're already going to that reduction of 125 words per minute. And unfortunately, um, with eye gaze communication devices, communication devices that you're using eye gaze to access it, your, speech, your words per minute is going to be even lower, maybe around 12. So um, at this time, you really want to start talking with your communication partners about how are we going to communicate where you're giving me the time to say what I need to say. I still have a part in the conversation. We want to make sure that that conversation happens because these changes are going to occur. And um, it's just good to be on board from the beginning. So at this time, when you're looking at the AAC eval, it does not always mean that you're gonna go for a dedicated speech generating device system from the start. We're gonna talk about some communication apps in a little bit too, because you know, at some working with your speech pathologist, they'll help you determine what's best. Uh, but sometimes if your speech goes first, but you're still using your hands and walking around and maybe at work and you might need something lightweight, there are other options like a communication app on your phone or tablet. Again, that's what you're going to speak with your speech pathologist about, and they're going to do a feature matched assessment to really determine what's most appropriate for you. During that feature match assessment, they're going to look at four key components. Um, who are your communication partners? What environments are you communicating in? Again, like, are you still working? Um, what are your communication needs right now? And then they're going to take some measurements about your speech, language, motor abilities. Do you have any trouble with vision or hearing that they should know about? Um, and then look into who will be helping you with this. Who are your supports? And then do you have any struggles that we need to figure out? And then finally, you're going to try out a lot of different uh, pieces of equipment. And you're not going to just try it for like 30 minutes, but we're going to try it in different environments to see what truly fits for your needs. All right, and then we also hear, well, I don't know if my speech pathologist is uh, aware of speech generating devices or AAC, or I don't even have a speech pathologist. So starting with asking some questions and, you know, again, being your advocate, you can say, have you ever worked with a patient with ALS before? How many patients with ALS have you worked with? Are you familiar with the speech generating devices on the market? Are you familiar with insurance guidelines? These are all fair questions to ask. And um, going back to where you get treated for ALS, they should be able to help you find that speech pathologist that can complete this evaluation. All right, so here are some speech generating devices out. Um, are any of y'all familiar with these? Are any of you using any of these? Go ahead and put it in the chat if so. Does this guy look familiar to anyone? All right, um, communication apps. So another question we get is, well, which app should I get? Which one's the best? But there is no one best app, just like there's no one best solution for everyone. It's what is best for you. And it's using that feature match evaluation with your speech pathologist to find out what's best for you. We can't go through all the features that should be looked at, but some of the ones that um, you might want to consider are, did you do voice banking and message banking? 
well, which apps are compatible with that voice that you did make? Um, which ones have an organization of those? What is the organization of stored phrases or your ability to store those phrases? And does it make sense to you? Is it easy for you to go through that app and navigate it? Um, can you customize it? You know, if you do have vision impairment, can you change the color on it or change anything to make it easier for you to see? Familiarity with operating system. If you've always been an Android user, you might not want to change to an iPad for an app. So is there an app on your Android device that works for you? Let's look into that too. Positioning is super important. Um, if you're looking down at the iPad all day because it's in your lap, that could be a lot on your neck and that could be a lot of fatigue. So maybe we could get something that could make it eye level uh, and make it a little bit easier to access it. And then there's tons of ways to access these communication apps based on, is it on your tablet, your phone? We can even use a stylus, which might make it a little bit easier. Some of them have head tracking built in. We're gonna look a little bit more at access in just a second. All right, so here are just different ones. Again, we don't have time to go into all of them, but um, is anyone using any of these apps or familiar with these? Uh, another thing we might wanna consider is if you do have a lot of trouble with technology, it's kind of like scary, intimidating. Well, maybe we wanna look at something that could transfer to a full dedicated system if you ever need to change from an app to a um, dedicated speech generating device. So some apps like Dialog AAC, this actually is present on the PRC Accent as well. Grid is also on a lot of different communication devices. Those are just some things that we might wanna think about. All right, so talking about access, voice control is something that allows you to control your smartphone, tablet, computer, um, without use of your hands. So let's say your voice is actually still strong and you're, you don't need a communication app, but you need something to help you access your email or make phone calls because your hands and your legs don't work as well as they used to. Um, we could look into voice control. It's actually built into most smartphones, tablets, and computers, and it's free on a lot of systems, but the quality varies. So there are also options on the market that do cost money, like Dragon Naturally Speaking, and maybe the quality works better for you. Uh, some other considerations are if your speech, it's hard for you to project that speech, then maybe we could use a microphone. Again, positioning is always important. And I like to mention this because I've mentioned voice control often and people are like, oh, Siri doesn't work for me. But Siri is not voice control. And we're gonna show you what voice control is. Go home, open messages, tap new message, tap message, show numbers, tap two. So you can see, even as I'm saying the wrong command, it's telling me what to say or suggesting things, which makes it pretty, a lot easier to use because you're learning with tap. Hey. Um, and also you can always add the show numbers tap on there. Message. And then you don't even need to know the commands because you can just hey. tap which number you want. Tap send. Go home. So again, that's a free option that's built into the iPad and iPhone. Um, okay, so adaptive mice and keyboards. Sometimes, you know, we're using our technology and our hand function is changing, but we can still access the computer. We just might need to try out some other types of mice. This is something your occupational therapist could also work with you on to find what's best for your mobility. Um, so for example, this is a touchpad mouse this is a trackball. The trackball might be good for someone if your shoulders don't move as well as they used to, but your fingers are still pretty good, then that one's actually pretty good because you don't have to use that movement of the mouse all over. 
this is an ergonomic mouse. So, you know, maybe it's the opposite in your shoulders. You still have that good push and pull and move around, but you don't have as good mobility in your fingers. That might be a good option out there. Um, these are all just options that you can try out low cost that can allow you to continue accessing that technology you've been using. So we don't have to learn a completely new method right now. So switches and switch scanning. There are so many switches out there and so many uses for them that we can't go into all of them today. I'm just gonna to touch on three of them briefly. Um, switch scanning is something that can be added to tablets or phones or communication devices. And it kind of goes row by row and then column by column, or you can change the way it does it. But essentially it activates it in a scanning method. Uh, this is a proximity switch. So it means that you don't even have to touch it. You just have to get close to it and it's gonna activate. What you can connect it with is maybe a call button or an emergency alert system. So uh, let's say you can't do the full push of this over here, but you can get close to it, the close to proximity. Connecting those together could give you a way to alert your caregiver in the other room. And then we can use it for activation. So this is actually the control bionics neuro node, which connects with their eye gaze system. Um, and this type of system, you can use your eyes to look around on the device, and then you would use little movements to select it. The neuro node is a must EMG switch, so it is looking at your muscle movements and can really read pretty small movements or your movements in space. All right. And head control. So um, this is really important to think about like your head and neck stability with this one and do you fatigue easily in your head and neck? But um, there are lots of options out there that work in different ways. So for example, this one, you would need a little dot and it's going to track where that dot is on your forehead and make selections that way. Head control basically can control the mouse on your computer or control the cursor and then select things that way. Um, both this glass house and the Qizono, instead of having a receiver that's looking for that dot, is reading your movements in space. It doesn't really matter for you to know that much, but um, just so you know, you would have to wear something like the glasses or the headband, and it is always important to consider that as well. Um, the iPad has head tracking built into some versions and some communication apps. It's not yet allowed, it does not yet allow you to control the entire iPad, but you can use it within a communication app to communicate and select your message. Uh, there are ways to adjust the sensitivity on these head mice. So maybe your range of motion or the ability to move your head back and forth changes a little bit. You can make it more sensitive to accommodate for that to a certain extent. What is also important to consider is that we hear often when you're using a head mouse in bed, it's hard to have that vertical or up and down head movement. Does anyone use any of these currently? All right, so here's a video of someone using the Qizono. She's using it with the app Predictable. Um, part of the day, she has trouble communicating, so we added this to a computer that she uses. Um, it's actually a Chromebook, and the Chromebook has this dwell selection built in. She also uses it to communicate with her uh, daughter's teacher at school. So she was having a lot of trouble using her computer ahead of time, and now she uses it both for communication at a distance and for communicating with those around her when she's pretty tired. And eye gaze. Many of you have responded to the survey that you are familiar with eye gaze. And that's probably because it's one of the longer term solutions for individuals with ALS. Those ocular motor or eye movement skills are typically unaffected for individuals with ALS. So again, this is one of the solutions that are more long term. Um, 
but it is super important to consider the positioning with eye gaze and the impact of head movement on use. So if you are still moving around quite a bit, if you're using a desk chair still at work um, and your desk chair rolls and swivels back and forth like this, it might be harder to maintain that good position that you need for eye gaze. So you can see in this dot over here, eye gaze works by the infrared lights, the little red lights at the, on the eye tracker bounce off the retina in the back of your eye and it makes this little glint spot or this spot right here. And then there's a camera that kind of picks up where that is. And that's going to tell the computer where you're looking on the screen. So all of that to say that if your head moves around a good bit, or you don't have a good position, it's gonna be really hard for it to capture this blunt spot right here. You can use eye gaze just on your regular computer or laptop for some operating systems, primarily Windows, um, or you can use it as a dedicated speech sharing device if you're having trouble speaking as well. So in addition to the positioning, some other difficulties that you might experience that might affect your ability to use eye gaze is um, any type of medications going to kind of change or affect it as well. So any saliva reduction or allergy medication, it's gonna dry up your eyes just like it dries up everything else. So that would be good to talk to your doctor about can I use re-wetting drops, how often. Um, any type of muscle relaxers are gonna relax those tiny eye muscles just like they do the big muscles. And that's going to make your eye bounce around a little bit more and then make it harder to have those really precise selections. I think a lot of people are familiar with how lighting affects communication devices. Definitely outside, there are now communication devices that do better outside, but it will still affect it um, with display brightness and glare off your glasses and many other, way, many other types of lighting conditions. Eye conditions like double vision, strabismus, droopy eyelids or ptosis also affect it. If you're using a BiPAP mask or a face mask like this, or sometimes that can kind of get in the way of the eye tracker. All of that to say that these do not preclude you from using eye gaze as an access method. Just because you might have some of these conditions does not mean that you can't use eye gaze. It just really emphasizes the importance of having that evaluation where you're looking at different eye trackers, you're taking into all the considerations, all of your unique needs, and finding which one works best for you. All right, and home automation. I wish I had all the time in the world to talk about home automation because it's super exciting. Um, it's something we always hear that gives a lot of people independence in their own home, which is pretty amazing because this disease takes away so much. So if we can give you back some of that independence, that's really great. Um, really briefly, home automation is a lot more affordable now than it used to be. It probably used to cost around 20,000 for a full home setup, but now with all of these off the shelf products, uh, it's more affordable, you, maybe around 800 to thousand dollars for a home setup. Some things that we hear are very useful are using the front door camera to see who's at your front door and then using this a lock similar to this to unlock it. So you might not have the physical capabilities to walk to the front door, see who it is and let them in, but using your communication device or an app on a tablet, you can either use voice control or eye gaze or whatever access you're using to go ahead and um, let that person in. I know that control of the TV is super important to a lot of individuals. And Comcast now has a web-based remote that allows you to control their TVs. We also find a lot of use out of the Fire Cube lately because that does allow turning on and off the TV, adjusting the volumes in addition to all of the other things. Um, again, all of these are super custom. It's not something that a one size fits all, but it's just to let you know that there are options out there to continue having that independence. Don't have your system set up to be able to access it immediately on waking up. When you wake up at two o'clock in the morning with that cramp in your calf, you don't want somebody wheeling over your device and determining if they can get your eyes in the right position for that. You want something that's down and dirty that's gonna be able to give you help you get that information out quickly. So we also use these in conjunction with other things. Uh, a lot of you may be familiar with the boogie board. That's this one down here. 
Um, they are the, I suppose, 2000s answer to the uh, Etch-a-Sketch or to the uh, Magna Doodle. Doesn't take a lot of pressure to write on them, but they're great for quick messages. And also um, a nice thing about them is that you don't have to have any technology to make them work. They don't have to plug into anything. That's the hallmark of low tech. And they're good for strategies with other things. So if you're trying to talk to somebody and they don't understand your speech, one of the things Emily was talking about earlier were cues, like first letter cues. Because the first sound of a word is the, what carries the bulk of the information. So if you can write down the letter on your boogie board and then go ahead and say the word, then you can continue Continue to use your verbal speech, but you've got this nifty little cueing mechanism. Dry erase boards work really well. The nice thing about boogie boards is that you don't get marker all over your, um, your arm like you do sometimes when you're using a dry erase board. Uh, many people are familiar with laser pointers, either because you're doing presentations or because you have cats. Uh, they work both for both of those things, but they're also really nifty as pointers. There are some out there that are specifically designed to be safe and have on and off switches. Um, but in a pinch, you can get a $5 keychain laser pointer from an office store, uh, go to the grocery store, buy a bunch of broccoli because it has those nice thick rubber bands around it, and then roll that rubber band around your pointer a few times to keep the light on, grab some duct tape and a ball cap, and you're good to go. Um, stick an alphabet board across the room and that's a way to communicate or a phrase board or a whole lot of other things. I have an entire book of low tech solutions um, of alphabet boards, ETRAN boards that I carry with me and we share with anybody who's interested. So let's just unpack that a little bit and look at some of those specific solutions. I hope that most of you have at least been introduced to the concept of an alphabet board, which is nothing more magical than letters on a piece of paper or anything else. I will tell you that I have written alphabet boards on cardboard boxes, um, paper, pillowcases, anything that I can find with a flat surface and a marker uh, and my Sharpie. So an alphabet board is just a way of being able to spell. If you can't reach out and touch something to spell, then we have you use a technique called partner assisted scanning. And what that means is that your partner goes through the choices and you tell them when to stop. So you identify a response that means yes, whatever that may be. Maybe it's looking up at the ceiling, maybe it's a, a grunt, maybe it's a thumbs up, um, could be anything as long as it's consistent. And so then you say, okay, well, if I wanna tell you what my husband's name is and you don't know him, I'm gonna spell it for you. So my partner would say to me, is it in, we're gonna, I'm looking at the board on here where it has A-E-I-O-U, is it in the A row? I'm not gonna say anything. Is it in the E row? I'm not gonna say anything. Is it in the I row? I'm looking up at the ceiling, cause yes it is. Okay, is it I? Nothing. Is it J? I'm looking up at the ceiling because my husband's name is Johnny. And that's a quick and dirty way to be able to communicate. It doesn't matter if I'm using that method with an alphabet board or if I'm using a phrase board, I've got a list of things that are common concerns or challenges for me. Somebody can go through them. And what I usually tell people is write down the things that you say frequently or ask for frequently and then teach your caregivers to say, oh, you want something, is it one of your phrases? If the answer is yes, you know what to go through. If the answer is no, the next question is, should I get the alphabet board? Because then you can start spelling. Um, this picture down here is an eye gaze board. This I actually make on transparencies that I get from an office store and I just type them out. I could write them out with a Sharpie too. The square in the middle means that no matter what you use for an alphabet board, you have to be able to see through it. So sometimes it's hard to see on a transparency and I just use um, white pieces of paper for the choices, but it's a quick and dirty way of being able to communicate with my eyes. Not taking the place of a high-tech eye gaze accessible speech generating device, but a nice quick and dirty way to get some quick answers to a question. And this is also a plug for my idea that yes and no is not enough choices. Because sometimes I don't know, sometimes maybe, sometimes I don't care, and sometimes you have so missed the boat that we need to talk about something else. 
And then finally, this board up here is an ETRAN board, and ETRAN is iTransfer, and basically it's a combination of things. So you can see that there are six items here. There are six squares, and each square has six items, and it's all about position. So I don't think you can read what's on here, but um, let's say that um, choice down here on number five, this is cookie. So what I actually, this is what I might do is I might look at number five and then I would look at the number six because this item is in the sixth position. So the first look tells me what vocabulary I want and the second number tells me what position it's in. Some people think this is great. Some people can't stand it. Again, not telling you what you should or shouldn't do, just saying, hey, options are a good thing. So a couple of thoughts to leave you with. One is that when you're looking at hospice care, hospice often does not have speech language pathologists as part of their staff. And even if they do, the likelihood that they have an SLP who's trained in AAC is slim to none and slim is most likely on vacation. So you have to advocate for that and your family may need to advocate for it. And this is best done before signing on. So in earlier in the presentation, Emily gave you a list of questions that you might want to ask when you're looking for an SLP to find out if that person has enough experience or has ever worked with a person with ALS or has ever worked with a person who needs AAC. You want to ask these questions and make sure that if they don't have somebody in place that they're willing to get access to somebody who can help you. And the last thing I want to leave you with is the idea that it's not just about low tech at end of life. People who are at end of life still use high tech and taking it away or assuming that they don't need it robs them of their ability to here to help you with it. And I'm gonna kick it back to Emily for the last bit. All right. So really quick before we finish up, because I know that we are already over time. So thank y'all for sticking with us. Um, and what's to come? So just of three quick apps that I want to talk about. Look to Speak's already available only on Android operating systems, but it could be a really good tool in your toolbox. For um, example, if you go to the hospital and the, you know, the healthcare workers at the hospital aren't trained on communication devices, they aren't trained on how to calibrate or any of that. Look to speak doesn't require calibration. It's really just reading three eye movements, left, right, and up. And you can pre-program some phrases in there, like I'm in pain, I need medication, call my loved one. It's super, super easy to use, it's free, and it's on Android. It's called Look to Speak. Project Euphonia is something that you likely have heard of before. Um, the actual app itself is not here yet. They are looking for trusted testers still. What it is projected to do is twofold. The first part is um, having something that similar to like live transcribe, if you're familiar with that. Basically, it's gonna transcribe what you're saying in real time. So if you have you know, stage four dysarthria and not everyone around you understands what you're saying, you can have a device right next to your face that's kind of transcribing it and it understands you better than those around you. So that will be really amazing whenever it does come out, not yet ready. The other thing it's gonna do is work better with your Google Home and other Google Assistants to understand your speech even as it changes. Euphonia shortcuts is something that is also still not available yet, but they're also taking testers. So if you're interested in that, just let me know. Um, essentially, it can be put on again in Android. So we're really giving some love to the Android users. But um, on an Android, it'll read small face movements like opening your mouth, eyebrows up, things like that. And you can program it to either text a caregiver. That's one of my favorite things because let's say your speech generating device crashes. Well, this app, you just look at it, raise your eyebrows. It sends like, I need help now. Um, it can also speak phrases out loud and do a few other things, but that's primarily what I'm excited about with that one. Yeah. My name is Sarah. I'm one of the other Everything ALS uh, team members. Uh, myself and Zoe, who's uh, one of our other team members, is also going to be doing the questions with me. Um, so our first question is, is there, is an ALS patient has started voice banking with um, one type of software? What equipment is required when the voices completely goes away? So 
How is that transition made? Um, okay, so let me see if I have this clearly. Once your voice has completely changed and you need to look into new technology, what is out there? Is that the question? So if she's banked her voice before, um, okay. how is that transition when her voice is completely gone? Is there something specific that she has to do to make the transition from the voice banking software to um, utilizing it with maybe an eye gaze technology or something of the sort. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It depends on which platform you use. So let's say model talker, typically you can log in if you're using like a windows operating system with maybe communicator five or grid three, I think usually you just log in from the actual communication app and it should pull up the voice acapella. If you're using again, a windows operating system, you typically have to download it. And there's instructions on how to do that, which we can get you if you can tell us which platform you use. On an iOS or an iPad system, I think with acapella and some of the communication apps, you can also log in using it. Lisa, is that what you would say as well? Yeah, so it basically depends on you're looking at an end communication device. So when you're being evaluated for a speech generating device, then what you're gonna say is I have banked my voice on XYZ platform. And then the evaluator would know, okay, we're going to only look at things that support your banked voice and, and pulling that in. Perfect. Hey ladies, thank you so much for this presentation. I myself was find it, found it particularly insightful. Um, so thank you for your guidance on this particular subject that I know every ALS patient is very interested in knowing about. Um, my name is Zoe. As uh, Sarah said, I am one of the other a Everything ALS um, members, and I actually worked with Emily to come up with some communication alternatives for my dad. So she did great work with my dad, and I'm particularly grateful to her for that and grateful to both of you for this outstanding presentation. So um, I'll go ahead and jump into our next question. Um, one of our participants would like to know what types of eye tracking you would suggest in um, outdoor environments and which ones would be best equipped for those types of situations. So that's always an interesting question. And the answer is that whatever works best is the best for you. And no matter what we say about specs and no matter what a company may say about its product, don't buy it before you try it. So there are companies that say, hey, our product works really well out in the sunshine. And my response to that would be fantastic. Let's meet on a sunny day and see what happens. It's kind of like buying a car. They all do the same thing, but they don't all do the same thing equally well. And they may not do it in a way that you're comfortable with. Perfect. Is it possible to upload maybe old phone recordings or videos and messages into those voice banking softwares to kind of expand the database? Um, expand the database. So it is possible to upload old recordings on certain platforms. Speak Unique is one of the newer uh, voice banking platforms. And from my experience, they have taken quite a variety of the recordings that are out there. Um, and created a voice from that. As far as the database, that sounds more like a research question. So if you're asking for Project Euphonia, um, that would be a different conversation that I'm not exactly sure if they take old recordings. I don't think they do. Thank you. Okay, so the next question is regarding if you found any sort of uh, recommendations for an amplifier for Toby systems. So are the person who asked that question, are you using one of their dedicated SGDs, like an I-series, or are you talking about using their camera with a computer like a Surface Pro? Because one of the reasons why people sometimes go with a dedicated SGD is because they have amplification built into it to be able to provide that. Whereas when you use just a computer, whether it's a tablet or a laptop, they tend to not get as loud. And it's hard to tell you what I think is best because what is, again, it's, it's perception, but also I can't tell you what's gonna stay on my market, on the market. My crystal ball is in the shop for repair. It doesn't look like it's coming out anytime real soon. And so what's available today may not be. Um, that being said, I would, 
I would look at a Bluetooth speaker, or I would also look at something that plugs into a USB port. So remember that Bluetooth speakers can lose connections. So that's one of the things that you wanna be careful about when you're adding an extra speaker. And when you plug something in by USB, you can get much more power because you get power through the USB port, but it does take up a USB and it may suck some of your power. So um, it, that's, that's a long non-answer to your question. I realize I haven't given you any specific product. I, I can't say that I know of a particular product out there that I think is fantastic. Our next question has to do with um, kind of earlier in the ALS progression. Do you believe that speech therapy early on can help delay loss of voice or slow down progression? What speech therapy does early on in ALS is helps you look at the map ahead and be able to learn some techniques that might help you maintain your speech best. So in the earlier part of the presentation, Emily was talking about strategies that people use earlier in the voice. Essentially, your speech is going to go when it goes. And again, my crystal ball not being available, I can't tell you when that is. But I can tell you that speaking is not going to make you lose your speech faster. So some people worry that if they talk, then that might cause them to lose their speech sooner. That's not the case. But what you do have to think about is something that is true for ALS across the spectrum, which is the concept of energy conservation. So what I tell my clients is, if you are going to have a, an event or a circumstance where you want to talk, then don't talk a lot the day before. Rest up, rest your voice, control your environment. Maybe that's a good time to be using a voice amplifier because most of us don't realize how much work it takes to try to be louder. So the other thing we do is just tell people about compensatory strategies. So the, the video that Emily showed you of the gentleman using the voice amplifier, not only was his voice louder, but he was using some really good strategies. So if, you have, um, if your diaphragm is impacted, loudness is a function of breath support. So what I, I can't make you able to breathe any more deeply because the muscles are affected. What I can do is teach you to breathe more often so you don't have to breathe so deeply. So those are the kinds of things that speech language pathologists can help you with. And they're very, very valuable, I think, as services. Awesome. So sort of building off of the last question, um, some of our participants would like to know if you've seen that certain voice exercises have been particularly effective in um, declining the, the rate of voice decline. And if so, what are these exercises? I can say that I have seen zero evidence that voice exercises help keep your voice. The only thing that I see about voice exercises is that the people who do them in therapy sessions get tired faster. Um, going back to the assistive technologies, do you know if the systems can cross communicate? Can an acapella voice bank talk to a Toby program and vice versa? Yes, um, absolutely. Acapella works on Communicator 5. It works on um, Snapcore, which is another one of Toby's uh, communication softwares, and it works on a lot of iOS apps. Lisa, does your handout that we're sending out have that information on there? The voice banking one? Mm -hmm. No, the, um, the iPad comparison or the app comparison. Um, yes, actually, there's, um, we're going to be, we've put together three handouts for you guys, and one of them is a handout on text-to-speech apps for both iOS and Android platforms. Um, disclaimer, I don't want to tell you that it is the definitive handout. It's just a bunch of things that I've used in work. And what I would encourage you to pay attention to is the categories. You know, again, Emily in the presentation earlier was talking about the importance of feature matching. And feature matching is critical across every piece of technology that you look at. You look at the things that you need it to do, and then you find the technology that does what you need. You don't say, here I am person, let me fit the let me fit myself to the technology. No, we need to fit the technology to you. 
So in there's a, a line in that handout about whether or not it works with voice and message banking. And I have indicated for the ones that I know of that um, if it works with Model Talker or if it works with Acapella or if it works with the voice keeper. Um, again, this is not definitive and, and you should continue to ask questions and things change. What didn't work this week could work next week. They might make a, a change or an upgrade, but we, I, we have tried to give you some of that information. Yeah, absolutely. And if you have a specific one that you use in a specific app that was recommended for you, um, we can go ahead and tell you if it's compatible or not. Awesome. So um, another question that we received is um, about Nuos. And if you could explain what exactly Nuos is and um, anything you want to comment on brain communication and where that is in the future of brain computer interface and that sort of area of communication. Um, thank you. Lisa, do you want to take the BCI question? Sure, why don't you take the NUOS part? Okay, so NUOS is a um, type of BCI that is still in testing. I think they're using it actually at Harvard in one other location currently to test it out with some individuals. Um, Yep, and I haven't actually tried it myself, but I saw a demo of it and it looks pretty promising and interesting. Um, with regard to BCI or the concept of brain computer interface, there are, I think, five different centers around the country that are currently working with NIH grants. I know Melanie Friedokin is working with one in Portland at, uh, in Oregon at Oregon Health and Sciences University. I know Kevin Pitt is working with one. I think Katya Hill has one. Um, Jane Huggins at the University of Michigan has one. Um, the, the bottom line is that there really aren't products out there. Um, I, I'm not gonna, I don't know anything about Nuos, so I'm not gonna comment on that either way. I'm just gonna tell you what I know about the current state of research for BCIs. I will also tell you that there's a webinar that's coming up, I believe in two weeks, and I have to find a resource for you, but it is a webinar specifically on the use of brain computer interface for augmented communication. And I will um, I'll let Emily take whatever the next question is while I see if I can find that resource for you. Okay, Lisa, I actually have it still up because I don't close any of the tabs on my computer. So I have that for you right now. <laughs> I'm gonna drop it in the chat. Great. And All the right. webinar is free and available to anybody who wants to sign up for it. They did one a couple of weeks ago on um, privacy in uh, data sharing and, and privacy concerns in AAC, and there were some just amazing information. So um, it's good people um, given a lot of good information. Um, our next question says, which communication device would you recommend for working with multiple screens? So it sounds to me like you're the person who's asking that question is looking to control their own computer as opposed to working on something else. All of the SGDs out there, I'm not talking about iOS based, I'm talking about the actual speech generating devices that are the full fledged devices. Um, those are all Windows based. And so the question that I look at with some of my folks is, are we looking at compare? Are, are, we, are you looking at needing to have access to your own stuff? Do you have software that you use that is not something that you would want to load on something else? For example, one of my patients is a website developer, and he uses 228-inch monitors uh, to be able to do his work. And so he has an iGaze system that allows him to specifically control his computer. To my knowledge, I know that LC Technologies has a system that will allow you to control a third computer. I know that the Frankie Romit company also. So LC Technologies iGaze Edge will let you do that and PRC's Accent will let you do that. I'm not familiar with other devices that will specifically let you control another computer like that, but I have had tremendous success in using Splashpop and other mirroring technology to be able to control another computer. The difference is that when you use something like Splashtop, you are seeing the actual screen of the other computer on the device that you're using, as opposed to using a device to control the other screen or screens. Yeah, and Toby does, um, through their Snap Core communication app, they do have a way to control another device. If you purchase like this additional piece called the Access It, um, it'll kind of do the same. You would control it as if you're controlling a mouse on another screen. 
Okay, so the next question that came up was um, a way that you can use eye gaze to control your power wheelchair. And if you could comment on that. Yes, yeah, so there's currently two companies out there, Evergreen Circuits and Tolt Technologies. Both of them have a, um, a, I, a eye driving system is kind of what you would call it. They both call it different things. Um, it's somewhat available through insurance. I know that it's a fight with some insurances because it's still coded as like miscellaneous, but um, it is out there. It is available through insurance. It is something you can ask your ATP about. Um, our next question has, what are your recommendations for multifocus glasses or bifocals for eye gaze technology? Cut. <laughs> um, I was going to say kind of what Lisa said earlier, don't try it until you buy it. So try it out with the device that you're going to try. Sometimes the progressive lens work better. Sometimes it works worse. Sometimes you have to tilt the glasses forward or pick them up a little bit more. Um, trying out lots of different ways and looking into it is the only way to know which ones work best. So a couple of things to consider. Number one, anti-glare coating and eye tracking are frequently not friendly. They don't like to play in the same sandbox. I do have people who have anti-glare coating on their glasses who are able to do eye tracking. I have people who don't. I mean, I've had the experience where when we did the pair without the anti-glare coating, it worked fine. Um, the other thing that I have recommended sometimes to patients who particularly like a device but are frustrated because of the progressive lenses is to look at whatever prescription it is that you use to get on your computer and get a pair of single lens glasses that might allow you to do that. I'm not telling you I think that this is a fantastic solution that takes care of everything, just trying to work with what we've got. Thank you. Thank you. So the next question is about whether voice banking and message, uh, voice messaging can integrate into voice blending, and if this could all be done with an iPhone and with a smartphone, and whether there is a particular app that is well equipped for this purpose. Um, so after, and I usually take John Gassell and his team's lead on this. Um, they have found that the Zoom recorder is the app is the best for message banking because of the quality that it has. And um, it records in a dot .wave format, which doesn't ever degrade if you go to MP3 or something else like that. Um, so it is also a handheld recorder that you can bring with you, which is super important because you do want to record in the moment. The smartphone um, quality will be a little bit different. Message banking, so the voice blending I think that y'all are referring to double dipping. Typically message banking, if you want the best quality, again, the Zoom would be best to do it on. Um, and then you would do those 800 messages, upload them to a website, and then use acapella to complete the double dipping process. I'm not sure if I answered your question. So you might have to, um, Lisa, is that answering it, you think? I think it does. I would also definitely refer you to John Costello and his folks at Boston Children's Hospital. John's the guy who developed and pioneered this technology and we can probably, there's a lot of information on their website. Um, so I would, I would look at that. I've had people be successful with a variety of different things. Um, there are some apps now that actually, like the Voice Keeper, for example, has an app on, that you can download to your iPhone and it's actually designed for you to do your message, your voice banking on your iPhone. I know a lot of people who, I, I know some people who've had very good success with that. Um, it, it just depends. There, there's, there are factors that are difficult to weed out. So part of it depends on how strong is your voice in the first place. Um, it also depends on your environment. So you want to make sure that you control your environment and that it's quiet. Um, you want to make sure that you're not trying to speak too many messages in one sitting. So I have a really strong voice. I mean, I talk for a living and I can do it forever. But if I sit down and bank, when, when I sat down to do one of the voice banking technologies, I found that my limit for keeping my voice strong and the way I wanted it to sound, I could not do more than about 175 messages in a sitting. And that's someone who has no issues with breath support, no issues with vocal fold function, no issues with articulation. So those are some considerations. Um, our next question kind of 
flips it to where someone uh, may not be able to speak, but can you utilize their hands. Can you explain what a text to talk phone call is and what options are available out there? Um, you can use most of the communication apps to speak out loud and then call. Some of them actually have the option to send the speech directly to the other end, so to whoever you're talking to, as opposed to speaking it out loud, putting your phone on speaker and putting it next to it. It does have a little bit better quality if you send that sound directly through it. I know Predictable does that on the iPad. I don't know if it does it on Android, um, and I think there might be one or two others that also do that. So, um, Emily, you just brought up a consideration that we really haven't addressed, which is the use of the iPhone as a platform as opposed to the iPad. And a lot of people do want to use their iPhones and a lot of the iOS apps for communication can be downloaded onto the iPhone. The thing that you need to be careful of is that they may not necessarily work when you are actually making a phone call or using something like FaceTime. So those are specific features that you need to check out. And they change with the version too. So my Android, when I had a Galaxy 6, it worked with some apps really great and my S20 doesn't. Awesome. So the next question, and this will be our final question of the night. Um, can you discuss any suggestions on how to get an older person well equipped with uh, technologies when they haven't had much experience with technologies in their life? and how to kind of like aid that transition for them? Yeah, I think, I mean, just working with someone where they are, meeting them where they are and making sure that you're doing that training in a way that's not like way too advanced. Like we're not gonna start with something like computer control whenever they're, you know, not even as familiar with opening up a web browser and getting to the email. So it's just the same way that you would learn any other skill. It's just a little bit at a time and it's given the right supports from a speech pathologist um, who's gonna be there to help you with it. And it's learning early. So if you are you know, super afraid of technology, then let's start by just bringing your computer and working on a few things from the beginning. So I'm gonna to toss a couple of other thoughts into that. I agree with Emily 110%. Um, the next thing to think about is that just because your kid is technologically functional doesn't mean that their parent or grandparent wants to be. And it's not about the, the it's about the user. Another important piece is that I look at tasks, not at technology. So my question is, what do you want it to do? So it's not, how do I use my iPhone? It is, how do I send a text message? or how do I answer the phone or how do I find something? You know, I know my mother who is 84 and not the most technology with, technologically with it person in the universe um, said to me, do I need a smartphone? And I said, I don't know, what do you want your phone to do? And that's really what you have to break it down to. So when you start looking at things as specific tasks, then you can also just look at a single task and sometimes then the technology is not so overwhelming. And then sometimes you get surprised. I had a woman that I went out to see and she was, and this was I think 18 years ago and she was already in her late seventies and we were looking at voice amplifiers and I took out a headset and I put it on and she looked at me and she said, I look like a Borg. And I looked at her because I didn't think that she really knew that Star Trek reference, but that was exactly what she was referring to um, with that piece of technology. And so we don't know, just because folks are older doesn't mean that they don't want to use technology or can't use the technology. But the most important consideration is exactly what Emily said, which is meeting people wherever they happen to be. All right. Well, I want to say thank you to you both for coming tonight. This has been a very informative and we can see it in the chat. Everyone's very excited and happy with all the information they received. And I know that this will be very helpful um, for everyone to get this knowledge and be able to figure out what the best um, technology devices and, and how to make their tasks work for them. I think that that was so important that you closed out with that, that make the technology work for you. I think that that's huge. 
Um, so we, I wanted to pass to Deb, who is one of our other Everything ALS team members, and, um, and then we'll get on to our open forum. But thank you both so much for coming today. This has been a great presentation, and uh, we are so grateful you gave us your time. Hi there, um, I'm Deb Fabricator, part of Everything ALS, and I just wanted to remind everyone that we're doing our speech project. It, we are trying to find biomarkers for early detection. We're creating a platform for researchers. We'll have a thousand participants and we really need your help. If you would please go to everythingals.org, click on research and we will, um, you'll find the information there. If you yourself can't participate, oftentimes people will say, what can I do? Ask them to go to everything ALS uh, slash research and join our speech study. Uh, and we are really committed to pushing the needle. We're in this battle together and we're going to do it together. Thank you, everybody.